When we asked you all about the subjects that you'd like us to cover in our Six to Fixing Six series, the number one was this one. How do we make decisions under pressure? It's really interesting because decision making normally is pretty straightforward, but when we're under pressure, the brain does some very, very odd things, driven by its demand for survival. So typically when we're under a huge amount of pressure, and that's reality these days, the decision-making process is compromised by our fight, flight, freeze response. It's an automatic response, which then compromises our decisions because those decisions then are survival-driven, very emotional, tend to ignore the facts and often result in disaster. So I'm going to take you through my garrot model for decision-making to help you deal with uh, those stressful situations. Now, you won't find this in any textbook. This, this is a, a set of rules that I've developed personally. So if you go into my office next door, you'll see this flip chart above my desk. So what I try to do every day um, is to practice these and practice so that they become automatic. But I really want to share them with you because they really do work. So garot, what does it actually stand for? Create the gap, drive down uncertainty, do the risk assessment, generate options, uh, trade-offs and then finally make the right decision. So let's just explore each of these in more detail. Number one, and this is really important, create the gap between the stimulus, that is the event, the decision-making situation, and your response, that is the decision that you actually make. The shorter that gap, in other words, if you react immediately, probably, certainly in my experience, the worse the decision is. Because that gap, um, because it's so short, you haven't really thought about it. You, you, you react instinctively, and that's that amygdala, it's the reptilian part of the brain, sort of trying to protect you. But it, 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 it results in a very emotional decision and usually uh, an unhappy outcome. Really good decision makers um, actually create a gap between that stimulus and the response. So the more important the decision, the greater that gap. You know that old saying, sleep on the problem, make the decision the next morning is, is a really good rule to follow. Now what I tend to do, this was um, uh, taken from a book that I read recently, to create that space, that gap, just say to yourself, A what? Uh, am I willing at this moment in time to positively contribute to this situation? Am I willing, I have a choice, at this moment in time, I can do it later, to positively contribute to this situation because if you're not going to positively contribute don't bother now by saying that to yourself and getting into that habit when you get a stimulus under a stressful situation that sort of internal dialogue actually slows you down and actually guides you to making a more reasonable less emotional more fact-based decision number two is drive down uncertainty um, the tools and techniques that we cover in our problem solving course, this is probably the best because it's the simplest. Always draw three columns because in any decision making scenario you have three components. The facts, the assumptions and the don't knows. And what you've got to do is to ensure that you don't make a decision like this with a high level of uncertainty and your focus is not on making the decision, the here and now, but actually on understanding the situation, in other words, driving down the uncertainty by getting more data. You're always going to have bits that you don't know. There's always going to be assumptions that you're going to have to make. But consciously what you're thinking about is not the decision, but actually driving down the uncertainty. So drive down uncertainty. Then do your risk assessment that is data driven. And all of you that are familiar with FMEA will know the severity the probability and the likelihood of detection. So once I've created the gap, I've driven down the, the uncertainty, then it's taking that data and actually doing a risk assessment as to the options that I have for the decision. Because then it takes us to those options. Now in decision making, so often people are just looking for one, um, but in good decision makers are actually looking for more options. Even though one of those options you might instantly dismiss, what you've got to really do is generate as many options as you can. And certainly what I do is the more important decision, I really consult widely with people, subject matter experts, people um, who, whose views and opinions I, I respect. And that consultation will take you from maybe one option to generating two, three or four. 
you know, if you're in a decision-making scenario and you've only got one option, think again, because that's not good enough. You've got to generate as many options as possible. And then finally, it's trade-offs. Um, because in any decision-making scenario, there's very rarely a black and white, you know, a clear yes or no decision. You've always got to uh, make trade-offs. You've always got to, and I always use force field analysis, you know, the reasons driving me towards that decision, the reasons against. And then once you've done the trade-offs, looked at the, the different options, you're then in a far better position to actually make the appropriate decision. So a really simple five-step process. They are my five rules. I remember them just by saying to myself, garot, create the gap between the stimulus and the response, drive down your uncertainty, do your risk analysis objectively based on data, not emotion, generate as many options you can, normally through consultation with people that you respect, and then look at the trade-offs, you know, the areas that you're prepared to, to give in on, give away, uh, and those that you are not, and force field analysis is a really good tool and technique to do that. Now that's the sort of decision-making process that we take our QPs through, our QP course. It does work, so go away, practice it. You do need to practice it and practice and practice until it becomes habit, but you'll benefit because the decisions that you make will probably be right most of the time. Now this is a really simple and effective model. You've only got five things to remember, it's good rot. Just to demonstrate how effective this is, there's another YouTube, another six to fix in six, that will demonstrate to you through a case study how I've applied this in a real life situation.